Hey, welcome everybody. Top of the hour and welcome to our uh, episode eight of our 20 for 2020 uh, educational webinars. Today's, today's topic is going to be on NFPA 1300. This is the standard for community risk assessment and community risk reduction plan development. So we're gonna give you a little introduction to this standard. And then I wanna show you how emergency reporting can help you do a better job adhering to that standard. Uh, before we get started, I do want a couple of quick shout outs. Um, Kervin Wolfgang, I know he's a frequent uh, attendee of these webinars, so good to see you uh, with us again. And a shout out also to my friend and longtime power user of emergency reporting out in Elk Creek, Colorado. That's Roger Parker. Great to have you guys on board today, and I uh, hope it'll make it uh, worth your time. I know you're uh, definitely a power user of the system, so certainly chime in if you've got some thoughts um, on this standard that's near and dear to you. So we're gonna do a quick introduction. Uh, we'll go over the objective for today. We try to keep the objective very simple, high level um, and focused. And I'm gonna do a quick, couple quick survey questions, uh, give, a, give you a background on emergency reporting, some of our system features for those of you that are not currently customers. Uh, we do open this webinar up to not just customers, but those interested in seeking more uh, information about emergency reporting and then we'll get into applying NFPA 1300 to your agency. If there's ever any audio or video issues, just let me know. Hopefully our connection is good, but if there are any, just send it over as a question. And uh, also check your uh, uh, GoToWebinar control panel. There is one handout there uh, about um, emergency reporting, kind of our main brochure that summarizes all that we have to offer. So with that, I'm gonna launch a poll here real quick. First of all, I'd like to know, are those of you participating today, are you a current ER customer or are you interested in becoming an emergency reporting customer? I'll give you a few seconds here to vote. I almost got everybody. And closing the poll in three, two, one. All right, looks like today we have all customers. So I'm going to cut to the chase and hit these next couple slides real fast because you already know this. That's me, a business development analyst with emergency reporting. I've been with emergency reporting since 2011, first as a part-time trainer, then uh, regionally, and then spread out into the international space and the Department of Defense space. And uh, current uh, Boy, can I talk today? Let's see, let's try that again. <laughs> All right, so uh, I spent 22 years in the fire service in Southern Arizona, retired in 2013, made the leap to full-time with emergency reporting, and have served as a, a, part, a product owner, then became a professional services project manager, and now serve in my role as the business development analyst, working closely with our business development team and sales team as a subject matter expert, as well as uh, working with key accounts um, in the system. Okay, never fun talking about myself, so let's get on to this. All right, so how can I improve my agency's critical community risk reduction responsibilities and to better adhere to NFP 1300. So what we're going to do is go over just some key parts of NFP 1300, and then we're gonna jump into the emergency reporting system so I can show you ways that you can specifically cite in NFP 1300 that you're doing within your records management system. So we keep growing. Those of you that kind of follow us, we're up, we're pushing almost a half a million people in the system, over 6,700 departments. And uh, as you, as many of you are aware, we do serve the entire United States Marine Corps, United States Army, uh, fire and emergency services worldwide. And it's been quite an adventure. Some of the places I've been able to visit as I've helped them become uh, stronger users of emergency reporting. Uh, one thing that you probably, um, I'm sure are aware of, but know that our, Support team is 100% US based in our home office in Bellingham, Washington. And they're available essentially from about 0600 to 1700 um, every business, uh, business day, so every weekday. And we do monitor 
priority one tickets 24 seven. Now, those of you that have ever had a priority one, say system down, CAD down, those are what we consider high priority, something that is preventing you from using the system at all, or they're not getting incidents being pushed from your CAD. It's important to note that in the system, you always submit those kind of tickets through the support portal from the support button in emergency reporting. You can send an email, but that email is not triggered to follow priority one tickets. And so what that means is, is within our portal, and I'll, I'll, I'll try and hit that later, but I just want you to know that within our portal, there is a drop down that allows you to select your priority. And if a priority is selected as one, that is monitored, but it's only monitored through that portal. So if you call or send an email, you'll have to wait to the next business day. I just wanted to uh, let everybody know how that works because not everyone is aware that that's how you get attention for priority one tickets and that is indeed monitor 24 seven. Um, we've got our 16 modules, which you are all aware of and we have substantial compliance for different NFPA standards, one of which we'll talk about today. And then we do have a business intelligence tool that has been rolled out to all of the states on our commercial platform. Uh, it's, we call it a BI basic. It is the first release of a new data visualization tool uh, that is kind of just a, a, a taste of things to come. And so in your system, when you go to the analytics button, the analytics module, you will see response analytics, safety analytics, and now there is uh, BI Basic. I, I highly encourage you to take a look at that. First, the first release has incidents, but there will also soon be for EMS um, procedures and medication and also uh, for occupancy and inspections. Um, because we're talking about NFPA 1300 today, I did want to mention um, our, our offline capable app, InspectER. It is a tablet optimized app that is available on iOS, Android, and Windows. And I know there have been some uh, some some need uh, to tweak some of the the uh, uh, parts of the the uh, synchronization and performance of this app. Or I can uh, tell you uh, with enthusiasm that our team has been working diligently on it, and uh, new releases will be coming to the uh, respective app stores um, to enhance the overall performance of this pretty cool app that lets you do inspections and update uh, building information and access it, frankly, offline if you needed to in response to when, you're, when the crews are responding to an incident. So it is not dependent on internet connectivity, but we'll synchronize any changes uh, once internet connectivity is restored. All right, this is why you're here today. So we're gonna talk a little bit about NFPA 1300. Got one more question to ask you here though. Actually two more. One, what type of agency do you, do you all work for? So take a look up on your screen. And are you career, volunteer, combo, or federal DOD, or federal or DOD? All right, almost everybody's voted. Closing on three, two, and one. Now oh, we got a good mix today. Let's take a look. So about two thirds career. We got a combo and then some volunteers with us. Excellent. Last question. And this one is directly relevant to today's topic. Do you have, does your department have a community risk reduction program? And when we talk about a program, it's formalized. So all of you guaranteed, well, all of you online today have some components of a risk reduction program, but is it formalized and made part of the department culture? Okay, closing on three, two, and one. Ah, this is interesting. All right, so uh, maybe one or two of you have a formalized community risk reduction program about a little over a quarter do not, and then like like most departments, mine included back in the day, um, we're working on it. But you can, you can see what we're gonna go over today. You have many elements probably in place. You just haven't formalized the risk management and risk assessment component of it. That's probably the biggest part. You're doing building inspections. You may be doing car seat checks. You do home safety inspections, smoke detector inspections, but how are you documenting that and how are you formalizing it? Okay, let's go back one. I closed, clear the uh, results. Okay, 
So take a look here, and I know some of these are text intensive, but I brought them directly from um, NFP 1300. And hopefully all of your departments have a subscription or a membership with NFPA and are able to access these at least digitally. Some departments just visited one in Lower um, in Pennsylvania, Lower Marion. They have binders full of the actual hard copies of the various standards through their subscription and membership with NFPA. But you can access, which I will show you here in a little bit, you can access free viewable but not printable, editable, not, well, you wouldn't edit these, but uh, documents that you can directly work with or download, but they do give you an in-browser capability of studying um, these particular standards at no cost. So the purpose of a community risk assessment program is to evaluate a community's risks prior to the development and implementation of a community risk reduction plan and programs to reduce, mitigate, or eliminate the community's risks. So that's a mouthful, and it's also in a bit bit vague and a bit bit nebulous. But again, as you as you think of the mission you're performing in your departments, you're already doing a lot of this. One of the things listed in Chapter Five is you've got to be able to, and I've highlighted the section here, 5.3.2. The community risk assessment shall include, but not be limited to, the following profiles to describe the community. And so our system excels in this particular section, the building stock, the hazards, economic, past loss and event history through the incidents, of course, and then the ability to document any critical infra infrastructure systems. One of the words that pop up a lot besides risk in this standard is data. And you're gonna see the value of being able to collect this data because at the end, you've got to be able to justify your program for funding, you've got to be able to measure the results of this program. And it's hard to measure fires that never occur, but I wanna show you some metrics that uh, will allow you to tell your story and to further enhance the value of this program to, the, to your community because you've gotta be able to communicate this in a meaningful way to your community, both external stake stakeholders the people that are gonna be, you're helping reduce their risk, as well as internal stakeholders that are gonna control the purse strings and help you fund these programs moving forward. So one of the things I, I wanna mention is 7.6, so chapter seven, paragraph six here of NFP 1300 states that an annual report of, a, of the CRR plan, including implementation and evaluation of the specific programs shall be prepared and shall be presented for review to the appropriate agencies and so forth. And so to me, is this a separate altogether report of the plan itself or is it incorporated into your annual report? I've seen some pretty spectacular annual reports done by uh, many of our customers out there. And invariably there's always a section on what their prevention division is doing, what their public education division is doing. And so that's part of telling your story. And I like that they specifically cited here as on an annual basis. So do they say it has to be its own separate uh, annual report? Maybe you could interpret it that way. Like anything that's almost like a, a legal document, it's subject to interpretation. But I would suspect that you would be adhering pretty close to this part of the standard if you do an annual report that includes an assessment of your community risk reduction plan. So this one, a lot of text, so I just want you to take a look at this because one of the things that they talk about and something we actually do in emergency reporting is what's called the five whys. And you keep asking why to get to the root cause. So it's like that, that toddler that keeps going, but why, but why? It's actually pretty darn good as far as ascertaining the root cause until you get down to where you to the level where you've hit that root cause. So here, okay, why are in, is there a rise in individuals suffering fire-related injuries? Well, batteries are missing and smoke alarms. Why is that? People are taking them out. Never had that happen. I tell you, one of our stations had battery-powered smoke detectors, and I remember coming in one day with all the battery doors open and the batteries out because why? They were low and chirping, and did we have any replacement nine volts? We did not. So that was unwise if we're gonna practice what we preach. And then there's a third why, because of causing nuisance alarms or the battery's low. Maybe they're installed in the wrong location. And then, then you can determine that maybe we need to communicate to our community 
that the root cause is smoke detectors being installed in the wrong locations. They're putting them in kitchens or garages or they're putting them you know, in just wrong locations. And so perhaps that can be part of your public education campaign to reduce that overall risk. And how do you get, how do you know this is happening? Well, you're getting more and more calls for it. So through your incidents module, through incident documentation, okay? Uh, so this is, is something to consider. And I put this in there because whenever we have an issue at emergency reporting, a substantial issue, they always say, well, let's go through the five whys and we work our way down. What caused it? Why did this part of the system fail? Or why did um, we have this problem on our deployment? And we go through that. And so this is applicable, not just in the fire service and in risk reduction, but also in just about anything that you do um, if you get down to it and are willing to have the courage to uh, tackle the tough questions here. Okay, so here was, here's another one in chapter seven, methods of data collection will vary depending on the plan component. So true. Three of those highlighted there are some that I'm gonna show you today. Counting numbers of attendees of a program, that's huge now in community risk reduction. So it's very difficult to know when you're working with schools, doing fire drills, doing public education classes, fire extinguisher classes. You don't know how many, how many incidents that you didn't respond to because the, the civilian was able to tackle it before they needed to call 911. But you can measure the contacts that you have in the community throughout the year. And those can be some pretty astounding numbers if you're measuring it correctly. And of course, on the prevention side, our traditional prevention mission, counting numbers of inspections conducted. And then this one's good, and I wanna show you how our system handles this, is the pre and post test comparisons of uh, inspections. And then those three that I didn't highlight, I have seen departments do this, but you can do random quality assessment surveys, customer participant surveys. So say you have a car seat program or a smoke detector program. We get surveys, all, you, you go on a flight, get a survey from American Airlines. You go stay at a Hilton, you get a survey. Um, you buy something from Amazon, they want you to do a review. Um, are we doing that in, um, in, in our fire departments, getting those feedbacks and getting that, getting that feedback from customers through simple, and keep one thing I've learned is don't make it a 10, 10 page document, a half a dozen questions at the most, keep them simple. Keeping them simple allows you to manage the data better. Um, Survey Monkey is one thing we use. If you've ever attended um, any of our online uh, educational uh, webinars, virtual Thursdays, or attended a regional training academy, we always send out a survey afterwards. That's, that's how we improve. We value that so much. After I joined emergency reporting and saw the value and the feedback we got, and especially when people take the time to write comments, I also now take more effort and be a little more con uh, conscientious on returning surveys myself. But think of that in your own fire department. Um, where could you send surveys out to assess your performance? And then, of course, presenter evaluations, like any class you would take, um, an evaluation from that class you conducted or taught um, is always very helpful for improvement. And again, that can go into your metrics and can um, be part of your annual report as well pretty powerful when you've got a 90% satisfaction rate with your smoke detector program or 95% rate um, from your fire extinguisher classes. That's a great story to tell to help continue to fund those programs. Okay, before we get into the system, in Annex B of NFP 1300, there is an example of a community risk reduction plan. And so I would recommend in this, you can go to it and we're gonna, I'm gonna actually do that here and show you what it looks like. And you can at least get an example of what a plan sh should look like. In the fire department, we're good, we're in the fire service, we're very good at, we pilfer, we plagiarize and we perfect. And I call it just sharing information and learning from each other. And when you have this embedded into a national standard, sounds to me like this would be a good, good one to model your own program off of. And then of course, personalize it for your own agency. So let me show you that real quick. So it's gonna load here on this page. And so in, if you go to nfpa.org, and you navigate to codes and standards, click on list of NFPA codes and standards, and then I search down to NFPA 1300. 
there's this little button here called free access. Now you may have to sign up and register, but once you do, it will give you this window. that will pop up and you click agree and please load. There we go, we get the pin, the pinwheel of death, there we go. So you're gonna have your table of contents here and then you can navigate through, but here in Annex B is that plan example. And this is from a few years ago, but you've got this plan. And so in order to justify a program, you've gotta have a plan in place You've got to be able to explain the whys and then talk about the different objectives. A lot of this is statistics and information about your organization that you can pull directly from your emergency reporting account. So I'll let you just take a look at that, but I highly encourage a review. Um, and this is one of the things if you're, all of you clearly because you're on this webinar are leaders in your organization and looking to improve it. Always, what will always help bolster your case is citing a national standard or if you're going ISO or for accreditation, something that you can say, hey, here's why we need to do this. And so um, using a standard to back up what you're doing and then citing it will hopefully help get, uh, get uh, internal support for different programs. All right, so we'll leave that for now and jump into the system. So as we talk about an FPA 1300 today, there are gonna be a handful of things that I wanna talk about specifically on risk reduction in measuring risks within a building. And not just, we'll talk about it, um, the ROVAP score, part of our, our vision risk assessment tool. We'll talk about conducting inspections. And then one of the things I want to show you is when you do a follow-up inspection, you remember from the, the slide slide deck is that you want to do kind of a pre and post. And so the way our inspections are configured, you're able to take the original inspection and then go and do a follow-up inspection that preserves the original entries. And then you can quickly show improvements made post, post the reinspection. And I'll show you that here today. Before we proceed, does anyone have any questions so far? Okay, seeing none, let's go straight into the occupancy module. And I will be showing you an example of some of our customers that have given me permission to share their account to show what they're doing as a best practice. But we'll start off here in a demo account. In the occupancy grid, again, keeping in mind NFPA 1300 and the things that you have to measure, The very first thing we're gonna to go to is the hazards tab. This is part of our vision product. Now, some of you are probably maybe working in your account as I'm going through this webinar, I have two screens up or split screen, and you're looking right now and you go, man, I don't have this tab. So if you do not have this tab on an occupancy, it's because you don't have our vision product. So don't panic, it's not something that should be there. Um, it's just a matter of you know connecting with your rep and upgrading your account if you wish to have that. So going through this, remember in, in 1300, they, they want you to be able to analyze critical infrastructure, the types of buildings and being able to assess their risk to not only the troops, but to the community in the event there's a substantial incident there. In this case, it's considered to be a fire, but it could be an earthquake, hurricane, anything that would cause a loss of this structure. And so what I'm going to do is just quickly navigate through each of these items because there, there's just enough vagueness here that it's subject sometimes to individual interpretation. And one of the key things that you wanna keep in mind when you're using this part of our system is have a clear plan to communicate to the troops or whoever is going to be going out and collecting this data that there is consistency applied here. I might go to a Costco and you might go to a Costco. We do this and we'll come up with different numbers altogether based on how we respond here. 
you want to minimize those discrepancies as much as possible. So one example is right here on the help button to help you with this. It gives you an explanation of each of the fields and then it provides some examples. Certainly, and I strongly recommend that you supplement this with some examples within your organization. You fill one or two out and say, hey, this is what we did for a fast food restaurant. This is what we did. Common structures, big box stores, grocery stores, business offices. So people have examples that when they're out and about conducting these risk assessment um, of risk assessments of the building, they've got a guide to know, oh, that's what I should be answering here. So number of employees, that's pretty straightforward. Average exposure separation, that's looking at all four sides of the building and about how far away those neighboring exposures are. So Enfer's definition of an exposure is not the definition being used here. That this is our traditional fire service definition. We're going to protect exposures, which means these are structures or object cars and such that are not on fire, but could be if the fire is significant in the building of origin. In Enfers, exposure is considered another building or vehicle that catches fire from the uh, from the building or object of origin uh, in the original incident. So keep that definition here in mind. This is nearby structures, number of floors, square footage, straightforward. Property value. So here, what do you, how do you define each of these? And so this is where examples come into play that are really important. In this case, this is a small business. It'd be a business loss, minor casualty exposure. It makes sense. But have examples of each of these so everyone can understand what they should be selecting. If you've got a major, say Amazon just uh, built a distribution center and you're a small town, for example, um, a smaller town, that could potentially be a severe economic impact to the community. Major loss to the community, a hospital, a historic building, okay? And so keep those all in mind and make sure that communication takes place um, amongst everyone in the organization when they're going out to perform that risk assessment on a building. Now we've got life safety in the next section. Occupant load should be the maximum occupant load. Hotels, during the day, it's gonna drop substantially. At night, it could be full up, you know, no vacancy. You wanna always go with the worst case because as you go worst case, that's going to increase the score. You wanna be able to have a score that reflects the worst case situation, not necessarily out of you know, 16 hours of the day, it's low occupancy, but then it goes very high occupancy at night. You wanna go with that. Occupancy access is how can the fire department get to this building? Is it easy access on all sides? Or are we, we stuck because it's a, you know, row row house and row uh, row, na row house neighborhood and everything's super close and it's gonna be real tough to get between the two buildings. So maybe just the Alpha and Charlie side are the only sides we can get to. So then it would be two sides. Occupant mobility, again, nursing homes, for example. All right, probably gonna be non-ambulatory for the most part, even though many of them are, can be ambulatory. Hotels, I would select a sleep. Again, that just increases the score so you get a better, um, a more accurate assessment of its overall risk. What kind of alarm system is in the structure? And we know the definition between central and local. Is it automatic or manual? Or there's no alarm system at all? Are the exits conforming to the building code that your jurisdiction follows? ISO construction type, these are built in the occupancy module settings. And you can see there's been a lot of play going on here. Your list is almost not nearly this long, but you will then select the correct construction type. And so any questions on life safety or anything that those of you have that have done these would like to add to what I've mentioned? Okay, great. Risks are the next section. This is where it gets very confusing if you're sending the troops out to uh, do these assessments. So regulatory oversight, okay? So are inspections scheduled? 
versus mandatory compliance. These two are always kind of confusing. And so mandatory compliance could be uh, something that they don't get a permit to be able to even operate without a, an inspection being performed. Others, you know, inspections are scheduled. Some of you have limited resources and you may not get the buildings, but every couple of years, that's probably here. If you have even less resources and can only get out now and then, then maybe it's random. And then of course, if you don't even inspect, then it's down to unregulated. Human activity. This is day-to-day -day activity, not for fire, the fire service, but for civilians. And so thinking of that building, typical businesses are gonna be this one. Okay, group activity, transient population. Domestic activity, no occupant control. So airports, for example, probably gonna be controlled access to unauthorized persons. All right, it might be even no access to unauthorized persons, um, depending on how you wanna look at the security of those premises. Here's one that the explanation we provide is not exactly right. Let me see if I can see this here, okay? It says experience refers to the frequency of incidents at this particular occupancy. Actually, you wanna think of it as build experience in similar buildings because in most instances, it's a rare occurrence. But what is your familiarity, the troops, the prevention division, okay, with those types of buildings? For example, Costco's, I use that one. Okay, or better still, actually, let's do this one because this is actually very realistic. The super neighborhood supermarket. Okay, the guys are going to get meals pretty much every day. Chances are, if they have good situational awareness, it's not just I'm going in to get groceries and get back to the station to make dinner. It's okay, what's the access like? Okay, are there any blocked exits? Are there, what's, what's it look like in that building? And chances are, you're probably gonna put that as a weekly or daily because you're very familiar with that structure. So I like to interpret this as not just how many incidents you respond to this structure, in this case, the R-Trail house, but how many times do you visit that building even on a non-emergent basis and how familiar are you with it? Because if you're well familiar with it, it is going to allow you to perform more effectively when an incident occurs because you know that building or similar buildings better. Does that make sense? This is, so it is not just that building. Okay, capacity to control. Thinking of your incident action plan for this building and the resources that you have available how well can you do it? Can you control it within the building of origin? Exposure to the same complex. You're gonna to have to deploy major amount of resources. You've got an oil refinery, extreme resistance to control, uh, and you, or you've got a hazardous material site that could be very, and the hazardous isn't just, everything's hazardous. Any firefighting activity is hazardous. What this means is it's a unique hazard. Okay, due to what's on the, the premise, it could pose a serious risk to responding crews. Then you've got your hazard index, limited, common, mixed, industrial, and then the nasty stuff. What's your fire load like? And then how is this defined? Again, if I'm a firefighter, if I don't have education on, on what this means, I'm gonna guess. You don't want guessing taking place. And so we give you some very specific examples of non-combustible, limited combustible, and so forth. And again, use this as the jump in point to provide a nice document and explanation to those going out as to what they should be picking in these, these different uh, categories. Available water flow. And so the difference here, people always ask, if the available water flow exceeds the needed fire flow, and this is calculated, um, I'll show you where it's calculated, but it's calculated on another tab uh, in the system here. If 
the, it's not so much how much more water flow is available or how little you have, it's is it above or below this number, and that will change the overall score. And then does, do the sprinklers meet NFPA requirements for design and maintenance? And so for example, I'm gonna change it to no, and then I'm gonna say we have, actually I'm gonna click save and watch that number change. Oh, it did automatically, look at that. And then let's say we have enough water flow, how that number changed. All right, are there dramatic drops? No, but but again, if you're entering it accurately, you'll be able to prioritize um, the highest risks within your community. Questions on this? Anything you'd like to add? I know Roger and I had some good conversation many years ago about this one on experience. So Roger, certainly chime in if I missed anything there. Okay, so where does the fire flow come from? It's on the pre-fire plans tab. And if you're putting in on this tab, the height, number of floors, width and length, you've got square footage, and then you've got to answer what type of fire load, fire load sprinklers, all right? And then it'll give you your needed fire flow. And that, that number populates back here on the hazards tab. Well, this is a new one that we've, a new field that's been added not too long ago. You have your occupancy zone on the info tab. This is the incident zone from the incidents module. So you can have that available here in the pre-planned document as well. All right, under inspections. Now we're not gonna go through and do, an, do a full-blown inspection. What I want to show you is as it's cited in 1300, being able to measure both pre and post. Um, a couple key things for you to keep in mind when you're setting this up. Before we do it, in settings. I can't emphasize enough the value here. Under inspection observation values, do not limit yourself to just pass fail. Why I say that is because it limits what you're gonna pull reports on. We have some terrific reports that will allow you to pull from these observation values. Also, these observation values, what you select here or what you build here are essentially what you get to pick when you print their form. So if you just limit yourself to pass and fail, you're gonna be limiting your ability to um, display in a printable view, PDF form of that inspection form because you just want, you might wanna show, I always like saying, okay, corrected, corrected during initial inspection, corrected upon re-inspection. These are metrics I can measure. And when the chief asks, well, how often, how often did they have a violation that was corrected upon re-inspection? Well, if you've got that here, so corrected during initial, corrected during reinspection, if I go to reports, okay, keyword search here, it's violations. Now, what, what I want you to keep in mind is think of this as observation values, because that's what it really is. You have all these reports that will allow you to determine number of occurrences per inspection observation value per occupancy type for date range. Okay, so this to me, very powerful um, reporting tool to, to describe, all right, we've had how many violations? Okay, actual violations as an observation value versus how many were corrected during inspection or how many were corrected during a re-inspection. I can tell that story as long as I built my observation values correctly. So just want to point that out. And then the other thing, of course, is your inspection results. It may be just pass fail, but this is the end result of the inspection. And again, I can pull reports against these as well. So think those through. And maybe it's, you don't need to have a list of 30 of them, but you may need a list more than just two. Okay, so we're going to start an inspection. Oh, you need to know this. Sorry, guys, hang on. All right, so on inspection results, again, those of you that are power users in the, um, in the uh, occupancy module know this, but look here, let me scroll up. So we've got citation issued. If that is the end result of the inspection, you can, you don't need to check both of them, check one or the other. If you require a re-inspection, require, two things happen here. You will have to put in 
a reinspection date, a scheduled reinspection date. And the system will allow you to do a follow up inspection. If you check this box, it will not require a date, but it will give you the orange hyperlink to start a reinspection based on the initial inspection. All right, so we're going to say citation issued. I want to submit, update that. And then now let's go back here and I want to show you how this behaves. All right, so we're going to fly through a mock inspection. Pick our forms. All right. I do this and check all. I do a bulk operation, set everything to pass. Click OK. Everything's passed, but I'm going to go through my inspection. And if I notice that there's storage beneath the exit stairs, I'm going to click Review Remarks. I'm going to set this to, to do violation. I'm going to put in my comments. I'm going to load a picture. And we'll pick one. Find one that's small. Here we go. I'm going to upload it. OK. We're going to click Save. And then we'll work our way through the inspection. Same process. You guys probably know all this quite nicely. But you'll notice I have a violation here. I'm going to click Next. And Inspection Result. We're going to use citation issued. I can do billable amounts. Again, we won't get into that one today, but that is available to you. All right, now I know that I need to click schedule single inspection because I selected citation issued, but you may get to this page. You'll notice down at the bottom, whoops. Oh, because there is one scheduled already. Hang on, let me clear these. Let me clear these. I want to show you what's supposed to happen. These have this is demo account action for you here. All right, this is what I so here there's no inspection scheduled and citations issued. Now when I go to this page, it will not let me finish this inspection. Remember, because I checked it's required. All right. So it'll take me back to page three. I've got to schedule a follow-up inspection. So you do a reinspection. You've got to do it in 30 days. Click Save, and now I can go finish my inspection. I can email them and all that, but what I want to show you, the value of those observations is right here. I just want to show the customer what was a violation, and so I can preview that report, and instead of a 10-page document, I have a one- or two-page document that will include that violation in an image, and then, of course, when I, when I were to go get my signatures. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and close this out. And again, in keeping with the expectations of NFPA 1300, what it allows me to do now is I can go do a follow up inspection from this original inspection. And you'll notice that I can do it right now. Inspector, inspection type is annual, but I can't change the form. Why? because it's basically cloning the form from the original inspection. I can go in here. I can select correct during reinspection, put in additional notes, upload an additional file, and, be in a, and I can then run reports against that, um, again, based on those observation values. Does that make sense to everybody? Any questions or anything anyone would like to add? Okay, the last part of, of how our system's gonna support you with 1300 that I wanna go into is right here in events. Before I even go there, I'm going to run a report. Because of what I put in the system, I get this report. This is 100% 1300 right here. Okay, non-personnel attendance per event type for date range. This is report number 1774. I'm going to run it for last year for everything, but I want to show you how it breaks it all out. So this is the output. Because of how I've structured my event types, I can then filter by any of those by category and event type itself. So if I want to just show 
my fire drills at elementary schools. I could do that, but I want to show you everything. You can see we've done these two fire drills, and I get to document my participants. All right. Again, a metric for 1300. A great way to tell your story that you visited throughout the year, station tours, you've connected with 2,219 people. Now, this is just a test account we're playing in. Imagine the metrics for your department if you're documenting all of this. So this is civilian contact for all of your public education and fire and life safety programs for reducing risk in your community. Car seat checks also. So that's what you're going to get out of doing this. All right, so I have no upcoming events. It's a lovely demo account, but I can look at past events. But let's say we've got them, and you can use this to schedule events, and it will appear in the calendar module as well. So let's do a new event. Whoops, sorry about that. Okay, so we're going to say that this is going to be uh, February monthly fire drill at Desert Willow. Now, you don't have to put in, I like putting it in here um, in the event name because that'll appear on the calendar. And so we're going to call this fire drills. The type is going to be fire drill uh, two dot emergency or elementary school. So one of the things I want to mention here, well, why did I do, why did you do this? Why did you do one, two, three, four? The reason I did this is because I want my firefighters to do it right and not have to be going up and down a drop down list. It's in order of age, preschool, one, elementary, middle, and high school, and then a college and adult. It makes it very easy for the user knowing that um, drop-down lists are organized alphabetically, alphanumerically, that they can quickly find what they need without having to go up and down in the list. That's just me thinking the end user because I want good data going in. Okay, so this is going to take place, oh, that's right, in Safari, aye, aye, aye. In Safari, our date picker, I have to write this ticket up, it doesn't, it doesn't cooperate. So, Let's do this, uh, da, 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 create event. Well, let me, it won't even let me do it. And I can't type it because the field's dead. I locked myself in, but that's okay. We'll go to past events so you can see what I'm doing. So same concept, all right? And I'm gonna edit it. And you can see the date here, if it would work in Safari. This is, I'm on a Mac, so that's why, all the all the Mac haters can be laughing at me right now, but this date picker, you would enter the date and time. I always check this box. When adding personnel, set the default hours uh, to equal the length of the event. You want to capture the hours that your guys are, are performing this because, again, it's another metric. Narrative, if any. I'm going to fill in for each person, and I'm zoomed in, so it reorganizes itself when I'm zoomed in. That's better. There's where you enter your non-personnel uh, non attendees. And then of course, any additional details. And I, the question I know someone's going to ask, so I'm gonna answer it now. Right now, these are all hard-coded. I'm with you, there's some, there's some things that I'd like to add in here myself, um, but keep in mind, um, these are the ones that our product owner determined would be the most used. And so it's so far, it's been quite effective, but I do know some people have asked for others. Then you'll lock the event. And once it's locked, okay, it will populate. So if I go to January 9th, a lot of things just took place here. This is ready to be, uh, data can be pulled in reports in our system. And then I have my calendar. So we'll go back a month. There's that fire drill. I can click on the details to show a printable view. And if I go to the 9th in my welcome page, this is one of the things that automatically populate in the daybook. So don't worry. Oops. Pay attention. That was the 20. It was this year. Now 
and there they are. So I entered it twice. And so we are working on making sure that the personnel populate here because it will populate. I'm showing all stations because it will show for each person at their respective station. It's pretty cool how they got that to work. They just said they have a ticket to update so the personnel actually show up here as well. All right, now another, again, telling your story and if, going back to the core of today's presentation, NFP 1300, let me show you in reports another metric that you can pull out. Daybook. And let's go with daily log, activity code. And I just want a high level. Whoops. For activity code. Okay, I want to do this one. All right, and I can do how much each person spent on any given activity. And I want to actually, I don't want to run a high level one for the whole department. So stand by, let me get that one. There we go. Okay, so our spent for activity code for apparatus, for example, high level. All right, I just want to see my whole department, how much time we spent. But here, I'm going to go year, and we're going to pull down events. Oh, and the apparatus has to be in there. So that's why it's not showing because of an apparatus. Do, 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 my bad. Hang on, guys. The re, the, so this report, if you're wondering why it's not pulling any report data, it's because there's no apparatus specifically tied to an event. And so by selecting event, there's no results because there's no specific apparatus. So don't run, don't run 990. <laughs> but you can run 906 to see a high level look at your department. And how much time is being spent on different events. And of course, Go back here. When we get it for personnel, you can run 1167. And then once that part of our um, daily log automatic, automated daily log entry is updated, you'll be able to see per activity code how much time is being spent per person on get any given activity. So it again helps tell your story between 1774, how many civilians you connected with in the community, and then how much time your people are spending on these events, because this tells the decision makers the productivity and the effectiveness of the program that you started based on follow the following of NFPA 1300. So one last report, because it kind of ties in with uh, NFPA or with the uh, Report 1774. So your details. So again, when you pick, say you did car seat checks. you're able to see this. How many were installed? So you're gonna get a high level number right here. So if you need to justify this as part of your community risk reduction program, someone's going to ask, well, how many did you do this year? I got asked that because they were trying to justify our CAR-C program. Well, how many did you do this year? No problem, I can run this report as long as I'm putting it into the system. All right, so we're almost at the top of the hour. Uh, I want to open it up to any questions, concerns, uh, thoughts, anything that you'd like to share from your organization. Um, today, we went over a quick look at some of the key elements of NFPA 1300 and how those elements can be documented because one of the key things in 1300 is the ability to collect this data and help perform those risk assessments. 
um, how you can do that within an emergency within emergency reporting using our vision risk assessment tool, our OVAP scoring, occupancy vulnerability assessment profile scoring, conducting inspections, most notably the ability to not just conduct an inspection, but to quickly and easily see the effects of, of your initial inspection on a reinspection, and then documenting all of the events that you do that are non-emergent based that you do to serve your community, and then being able to extract that data into a meaningful format to supplement and justify your community risk reduction program. Okay, when will the revised occupancy module be rolled out to the rest of the customers? Ah, so this is from Joseph. So part of it, as you can see here in settings, it's got the new UI. We are in the process, in fact, this week, we are testing internally the, the new occupancy module, which essentially functionally, it will be the same. Uh, but we are testing it this week with an expected rollout within the next uh, two to three weeks. So good question there, Joseph. Thank you for asking. Any other questions? Anything that you'd like to share success-wise? And I'm happy to open up the micro, your microphone if you have one in front of your computer, if there's something you'd like to share that you've had success with in your, your organization, both in community risk reduction and being able to tell that story uh, using emergency reporting since everybody here today is, is an emergency reporting customer. Amanda, let's see. I understand that the additional items section of the events module is hard-coded, but will there be an input option for additional for additions or changes. So uh, Amanda, the best thing I can tell you, is yes, there's been conversations about it. Is it on the in immediate roadmap? Not, not to my knowledge it isn't, but what I would like you to do, and you may have done things like this, done this before, but in, if you were to click on the support button here, so everybody kind of watch how this process works. If you've never logged into our support, you will need to click sign up here. But if you've logged in, I'm going to log in as a civilian like you would see it. You're going to land on our customer success center. What you want to do first and foremost is click on right up here on the top, community. On the right side, you're going to see feature suggestions. Please put that in there because our me, our whole team really, our sales team, support team, product owner team looks at this. And this helps as, a, as one of the components, not our entire decision-making process, but it's a component that feeds into the decision-making process. If they see there's a ton of votes for a specific item, say, I need more things on that additional items list, then it helps fuel that fire and makes a, a more compelling business case if they can see a lot of votes. So I really, am, really want you to go ahead and put in that suggestion, and then everybody here can vote on it. So does that make sense how to get there? Our support page from the system, click support, you'll land on the success center, you will click on community, and then you'll hit feature suggestions over here on the right. We can see if it's been suggested, let's see, I'll just click events. It may have already been su suggested and then you can just you know, add flyers to it, that's a good one. I won't take up more time, but see if there is, someone's already done it. They may not have, you may be the first one, but it has been asked before, so. Would you recommend data input for home safety surveys post fire in the events module? Ah, oh, great question. So when you say home safety surveys, um, so you have a fire and then you go out after the fire, say it's not devastating to the home, uh, it's, they just need to clean it up and it's, you could still live there. Uh, and you want to go back and make sure that um, anything that could have been a contributing factor of the fire has been mitigated and you want to document that. I personally would document that in the events module. Yes. Is that, did I explain that process? Is that how you do it, Amanda? So if someone, if you have a fire, you send a crew out afterwards once the property is restored to ensure that the, fire, the home is safe. Is that, is that right? So kind of a courtesy follow-up, hey, we know you've had a fire, we wanna make sure you don't have another one. Um, is that how, how your uh, department does it? Oh. 
while Amanda's typing, I will uh, see if there's any other questions. And if there's not, um, thank you everybody for joining me today. Uh, we're gonna have another one next Friday, uh, another webinar, and let me show you what that topic's gonna be. So you'll get, you'll get emails and then it's on our login page, but if you ever wanna see the schedule for these webinars, click on resources on our, home page, on our marketing page, just emergencyreporting.com. Click on webinars, go to educational webinars. And you can see the one today. And then this one I'm traveling. So this one's gonna be bumped to uh, Valentine's Day. We're gonna talk about PPE and, and adhering to NFPA 1851. So if you've got a PPE program or wanna get a good PPE program, you're gonna to wanna to tune into that one because our system does a bang up job on tracking and managing PPE to keep the guys safe. All right, well, thank you everybody. Um, have a good day, a good rest of the week and upcoming weekend. And I hope to see you here uh, next Friday for the next installment. It'll be episode nine of our 20 for 2020 webinar series. And uh, take care and thank you so much. Uh, Amanda, she responded, this would be for the community around the, oh, around the fire home. Starting a new program, we wanna cap capture data for future use. Visit homes in post fire community and survey home for safety issues. Yeah, to me, that's events all the way, Amanda. The events module can do a beautiful job tracking that. Yes, great question. You're very welcome. All right, that's a wrap. We're past the top of the hour and we'll catch you next week, everyone. Thanks so much.